you've prepared a new performing edition of, of the work, is that, that right? Right. The, the problem with um, early opera in general, and, the, and that includes all the Moldoverdi's, is that uh, people have today the mistaken notion that uh, what exists in score of the period is just a sketch and that it has to be orchestrated uh, to be completed. Uh, that's a misconception. It, um, the scores are complete for what, what they were meant to be, uh, which is that the orchestra plays only when the singers are not singing, basically. And um, that the rest of the time, um, the orchestration should just have to do with continual so what kind of instruments you use to accompany the voice. But uh, th those should be chordal instruments, not melodic instruments. So you don't need to um, compose a whole bunch of, of new parts uh, to, to cover up the voices. Uh, on the contrary, the, the idea of Monteverdi and others of his period is to let the voices do the, the acting and um, the, the claiming of the text of the story. And, um, but that means that the, um, the scores simply need to be interpreted and uh, they don't need to be rewritten. <laughs> uh, but the way that this piece uh, is done today is almost entirely done um, with arrangements in which the whole thing is, is completely rewritten and modernized and transcribed and, and arranged. And some very famous composers have, have done this. Uh, Luigi Dalla Piccola is one. Um, Hans Werner Hense is to, another. To this particular yeah. opera? Oh. Yeah. Hmm. And um, lots of other lesser people including uh, Raymond Leopard, who did the, the version that they'll use in the opera across the bay. Ah. And they're using that version uh, partly because they want to have Frederica von Stade, and they don't ah. blame them. Um, and she is used to that version, nice. so that's the version that she suggested that they use. But, uh, but in fact, um, it's... You know, not the most interesting of the versions, <laughs> um, and it's certainly, like all of them, uh, very far from what Monteverdi wrote. Oh, so what, um, what I'm doing, which, I, by the way, I, I was, it's a piece I've been wanting to do for a long time. I've done it uh, in concert in Lisbon and in Amsterdam, and I'll be doing it staged in Italy this next summer. So it is something I would have done anyway, but um, uh, I thought, when I found out that San Francisco Opera was doing it, that um, I wouldn't let that kill my plan. Ah. But on the contrary, instead of, um, uh, of bowing to them uh, or, um, or trying to compete, which would be even sillier, uh, that it would be interesting for the public to, uh, to hear two different two versions. Two different versions. So it was purely a coincidence. Yeah. Wow. But, uh, purely coincidence, but I also thought um, it would be very nice uh -huh. uh, that, that what we would do is present a kind of you know, workshop version uh, as preparation. And I encourage people to go to both. Right. Um, not because I think they'll like our version better. Um, I can't imagine they would. Uh, but it's certainly a very good preparation for going to the San Francisco Opera right. version. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what you get then is um, a much more complete and original 17th century version. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can go and, and get a more entertaining, uh, staged, spectacular 20th century version. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I think people will, will notice and I hope um, will learn from is that um, our version will be more complete, but it won't be as long. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Uh, because the, the tempos will be so much faster. I see. Because, uh, for instance, the opening um, section, um, I wouldn't call it 
aria, I think it's wrong to call it aria, mm -hmm. but uh, Federico Fonstata has recorded it uh, on a record that's called Italian Arias, <laughs> but uh, it isn't an aria. It's uh, what in uh, the period was called a monody, monodia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it includes um, uh, metered sections and restitive sections, but they run into each other in a very fluid, um, unified way. And this, this opening monody, um, we do, or I do, I conceive of doing in about uh, seven and a half to eight minutes at the most. Uh, Fonsada has recorded it. Uh, I presume she'll do it the same way. And it takes 13 and a half. So it gives you an idea. Um, if you stretch this over you know, a three hour period, then you get a four hour opera at least. And uh, so obviously they have to do a lot of cuts. Um, we're doing. Um, no cuts at all, except um, uh, one scene, two scenes, I guess, from the near the end of the opera, which I think are probably not by Monteverdi, so I'm using that excuse <laughs> to cut them <laughs> in any case. And um, otherwise, we do everything complete. So there too, it's a kind of um, instructive version for the public that they get to uh, to hear the complete scene and w and follow it with the complete text with a translation which we will supply uh, and then you get the sort of telescope shortened version uh, staged over across right. the bay right. Right. and uh, it's useful also I think f to to have the complete text um, before you go and, and hear it a, a shortened version so you get a fuller version of uh, the character of, of all the people who are, who are involved. Um, you get a more complete uh, picture of, of Ulysses and Penelope. Uh, of course, you get still more complete if you read Homer. But, <laughs> but uh, the complete packet I would recommend to everybody is that they read Homer, then come and hear our complete version, then go to San Francisco. <laughs> a big assignment. Right. <laughs> Uh, uh, this opera uh, is not quite as well known as, say, uh, Orpheus or the Coronation of Pompeia. Was there a reason uh, for the neglect? Or, uh, uh? Yeah. Um, first of all, it's, um, it's not as um, spectacular a story. <laughs> oh. uh, that is, uh, Ulysses is about fidelity, Pompeia is about infidelity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so I guess which is more popular <laughs> in, our, in our century. <laughs> uh, and altogether, Pope is a more, more spectacular uh, slice of history. Uh, but uh, there are some wonderful things about Lewis's. Oh. Is, that, is that really the only reason? The, the no, that's not the only reason. Um, another is that um, for a long time, Ulysses was thought to be um, perhaps not by Monteverdi. Oh, I see. And uh, whereas Popeye was accepted uh, without question. Right. Now the, the, the tide has changed uh, completely and, and in fact reversed so that um, uh, I'm beginning to think. Uh, I, I started out by discovering that uh, Popeye wasn't entirely by Monteverdi. And that's now generally accepted um, by all oh. Monteverdi scholars, especially since my article last year in the Journal of American Mus Musicological Society, in which I, I, I think definitively prove that um, large sections are not by Monteverdi, uh, including the entire role of Otone, uh, which is one of the major roles, and the entire finale. Uh, and various other little sections oh, oh. Are, are not by uh, Monteverdi and uh, I can't claim that I've definitively proven who did write them but I have a very good hypothesis oh. that, namely Francesco Sacrati whose uh, film Tapazza was lost for centuries and rediscovered a few years ago oh. and I did it uh, I conducted it at La Fenice in Venice uh, two years ago so that's two summers ago so that's um, now uh, something that I think is going to be accepted oh. eventually. But, uh, and I've published now my edition of Popeye, published by Novello in England, 
which has uh, on the title page uh, Coronation of Popea by Claudio Monteverdi and Francesco Sacrati. So libraries even will have to catalog it under those two names now. Oh, I see. So that's, um, that's where I started um, investigating Popea. Now I'm moving on to Ulysses and uh, becoming more convinced that it's almost entirely by Monteverdi, um, more so than Popea, and um, that uh, there are a lot of passages that are perhaps less spectacular, and here's another reason, I think, um, less um, things that catch the public eye right away uh, as, as scenic things, but I think if it's well staged and um, um, brought to life, and, and performed in a lively manner, it can be more uh, completely, thoroughly fascinating than, than even Popea. Yeah, and certainly more, more exciting dramatically than, than Orfeo. Though Orfeo is, uh, is still the one that has caught the public eye, uh, partly because uh, you have Gluck, so you have Monteverdi uh, as sort of opposite ends of the Baroque period. And, and also it was published, it's the piece that's been around longest, uh, therefore it's the most famous, therefore everybody thinks, that, well, you know, Monteverdi wrote Orfeo. Um, and then if you know him well, you think he also wrote Popea, but uh, well, it takes you know, <laughs> time for the public to catch on that, well, then there's also this funny piece called Ulysses. Uh, and I remember myself, um, in fact, I was, uh, I started to say I was a young student, but actually I was out here teaching uh, when I still um, thought that Ulysses was the least interesting of the three and even felt that it was uh, just too, um, well, too difficult to bring to life. Um, and of course, I still think it's, it's difficult to bring to life, but uh, I, I, I really sort of wasn't interested in looking at the piece mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I did the uh, Coronation of Popea at uh, Spoleto Festival, and um, Giancarlo Minotti was um, thrilled and, and fascinated and all the rest. Uh, and before the production, he kept coming by saying, I hope you're cutting a lot. <laughs> and I uh, said, well, uh, no. <laughs> And then when it was all over, he said, oh, I'm so glad you didn't make any cuts. <laughs> so that was a great success. But uh, he uh, said right away, why don't you do Ulysses next year? And I said, well, um, it doesn't really interest me as a piece. Ah, yeah. So I did a Cavalli uh, opera instead, one that I'd done here back in 68, when it is Mena. And... Um, Minotti didn't even come, <laughs> and uh, it was not the success that Popea was, and uh, I haven't been back since, they have, they have asked me, and, uh, but they've uh, most recently been asking for Popea again, and I am finally now doing that uh, again uh, ten years later uh, at Charleston in May. But uh, maybe this time, uh, Manani will ask you to do Ulysses next year, and I'll say yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those who are familiar with uh, Orfeo, but not with Ulysses, uh, how does the music differ? Orfeo was an earlier work, and, and uh, Ulysses is one of the later works, uh, one of the last works, I guess. Yeah, and it's amazing um, how different they are. Uh, almost incredible that they could be by the same composer, oh, yeah. but uh, because his style changed a lot. Um, not every composer does, of course. Uh, Strauss is another composer whose, whose operas span a huge period. Uh, and, and of course, there is a late Strauss style, but, but still you hear a unity. Um, but uh, that I think you don't hear in, in uh, Monteverdi. That, um, it's as if it were a completely different composer. Mm. Well, this is a time of great change in music, music very much in flux, and so undoubtedly absorbing different different trends that were happening at the time. Yeah, and in a way, one correctly, I think, links in, in the 
the mind's ear, uh, or fail with basically the, the 16th century. It's the kind of climax of the 16th century that it was written in the 17th. Uh, and then, uh, then suddenly uh, Ulysses and Popeye are, are completely looking in, in our direction. Uh, everything about them is, has to do with opera that came later. Uh, sleep scenes, mad scenes, uh, are his restitives. Uh, whereas Orfeo uh, is, is basically magicals, uh, dance music, and, uh, and very, well, uh, experimental and, and difficult um, restitive uh, or monody. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, Orfeo, um, Ulysses and Popeye are already um, monody that is very much more dramatic. Uh, it comes to life uh, in terms of the theater. Orfeo is, uh, is relatively static. Uh, it's a theatrical piece. It's, it's always marvelous to, to hear on the stage, uh, hear and see. But um, Ulysses and Popeye are, are very much more <laughs> theatrical. Uh, that's it. What was the, the original orchestra? It contained uh, just mostly strings. Yes, uh, Orfeo is again uh, 16th century in, the, in the, the richness and variety of the instruments that are used. Uh, Orfeo and Ulysses, uh, Propella and Ulysses, on the other hand, are um, works in which the orchestra is just background. Um, it's just sort of. Um, Functions only to uh, to alternate with the singers to uh, to accompany movements, uh, brief movements on the stage, but uh, it doesn't have um, the major role that it does in our thing. And therefore, uh, it can be done as in a small hall the way we are doing it. That is basically one on a part, um, five parts, so two violins, two violas and bass, and the bass is, of course, um, cello, uh, violone, uh, arch lute, theorbo, uh, and three harpsichords. Oh, three harpsichords. <laughs> 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 no waiting. <laughs> one right after the other. Uh, one for the Ritunelli, one, uh, two for dialogues, and one that I play constantly, uh, which is the kind of, you know, the conducting harpsichord. Right. And, uh, and then the other two uh, alternate between Ritonelli and uh, and the Institute. And you're working with a professional uh, Baroque orchestra for this uh, Magnificat. Right, yeah. Um, we have some students, uh, in fact, a couple of our students are in Magnificat, which is of course one of the reasons that we're hiring them. But, um, we really don't have the resources to put together even a small group. Um, and I don't know that we ever will. We're not that kind of uh, department. Um, though lots, as you probably know, lots of performing does go on in the department here at Berkeley. Fortunately, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have stayed here so long if it didn't. But um, uh, another nice thing about the Berkeley department is that uh, it is by tradition and, and by practice currently uh, flexible enough to to include this kind of collaboration between professionals, semi-professionals, local uh, local people, and uh, and students. So the production is, um, I'd say, uh, by a slim majority uh, students, but uh, it also includes them. Professionals like such as Magnificat and such as some of the principal roles, and um, the two principal roles are, are also uh, half and half. Uh, Ulysses is a student, Stephen Rumpf, who sang Pelias very beautifully oh, last yes, year. Yes, yes, right. And um, Penelope is Linda Childs, a black girl from Oakland, who's uh, sung around a little, but but um, is not exactly famous. But um, I think it's it's nice that, that I have a, a chance to uh, to show what she can do too in a, in a context which um, she wouldn't find in, in most cities and, and certainly wouldn't find normally in, in Oakland, uh, except that the university is here, and so. Yeah.